Amen. Anybody thankful for God's grace? Amen. Amen. When, you, when you hear it on the album, it, it sounds a whole lot different than that. Um, but the words are the same. His grace is enough for me. And uh, you can't run too far. You can't go too deep. I know that <clears throat> a lot of times in, in the age that you're in right now, you feel like that you may have made mistakes that you can't come back from. Uh, but when you get my age and you, you've lived uh, a little bit of life, you'll understand that there's no mistake that you can't come back from. Amen. There's no mistake that you can't come back from because his grace is enough. It's enough. It's going to catch you. It's going to carry you. It's going to keep you. And uh, you may have made mistakes. I'm sure, I'm sure every one of you have. And in our view, in, in our earthly human view, you know, it may be bad or great. But to him, you know, he's no respecter of person. And to him, it's, it's a failure. You know, he, he sees it as a failure. He sees it as a sin, and that's why he died on the cross. And to not only recover you, but to restore you. Amen? And his grace is enough. I want to uh, speak to you today, uh, and, and I've, I've, I've kind of thought about this uh, for several weeks now leading up to this day in this moment, like what would I teach in this in this setting, <clears throat> and what what would I say to you that would impact you the greatest? And I'm always teaching, I, you know, I teach at my church a lot, and so I have I have a lot of lessons that I could teach and a lot of things I could say. But this morning, I want to uh, just turn your attention to Second Peter chapter one, and I'm going to begin in verse one. Second Peter chapter one, beginning in verse one. Second Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. I want to point out just a few things as I, as I read here, a few hot words. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Somebody say life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Somebody say glory and virtue. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these ye might be, I want you to uh, pay close attention to this, this concept here. By these, that ye might be partakers of the divine nature. You might be partakers of divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith... Somebody say faith. faith. Virtue. Somebody say virtue. virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. Somebody say knowledge. knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. Someone say temperance. temperance. And to temperance, patience. Somebody say patience. And to patience, godliness. Somebody say godliness. godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. Someone say brotherly kindness. Godliness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Somebody say charity. charity. All right. For these things be... For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. 
Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. Okay. That last phrase right there is, uh, for me, a very hot phrase in the word of God because uh, the way my brain works, uh, my brain works very literally. Uh, and I like to read the Bible from a literal perspective. And when I read things, I see it in the literal sense. And so Peter says here, if you do these things, you will never fall. Well, I have an issue with this. And my issue with this is, is that we are human beings and we are like genetically predisposed to fall. Born in sin, shaped in iniquity. Everyone among you have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You, you, we, we are all in this thing called life. And in this thing called life, we not only have the potential, but almost predestined to fall. So how can Peter say that if you do these things, these few things here, you will never fall. So as a, as a student of the word of God, and I may have said this here before, but I'll say it again because I, I, I like redundancy. Um, some of y'all are like uh, Mac geeks and you're like Star Wars geek. I see a Star Wars shirt. It's very easy to pick them out. Uh, Star Wars geeks or you, you know, you, you, you're geeking on something. You, you geek. Well, I'm a Bible geek. Okay, and I don't say that boastfully or trying to, oh, you know, well, he's, no, I thoroughly enjoy the Bible and I like reading it and trying to, I like trying to figure it out. And I like to take a, a portion of scripture and do a good exegesis on it and try to break it down point by point. And when I read something like this, you will never fall. I, I, I got to jump into it. How, what can I do in my walk with God so that I'll never fall? Is that not? The, the ultimate goal here is to walk with him and, and, and live with him and, and have uh, a place where I can get to in him that I will never fall. Because if you tell me that I'm going to live for God for the rest of my life and I'm never going to be at a point where I'm not stable and sure and, and foundationally sure and I'm never going to reach a point where I can have confidence that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to fall, I have a problem with that as well. But from my, you know, upbringing and my teaching and my knowledge of the word of God and my knowledge of who God is and what God is and who I am and what I am, I understand the concept that I will at some point in my life fall and I have and I feel like I will continue. So when Peter says, if you do these things, you'll never fall. I want to know what those things are. What are those things? So today, I'm going to teach you how to never fall. That's legit. I have totally figured it out. I totally figured it out. I got it. This is how you never fall. And it, to me, as I study this out, it, it is so simple. Uh, never mind. I'll, you know what, I'll, we'll just break it down for you. So, how to never fall. Th th does that interest you tonight or today? Does that interest you? How to never fall. And the, 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 the base concept that I'm going to reach here at some point in this lesson, and, and, when, you, and when you see it, you're going to get it. It's going to be very, very evident for you. It's going to be very, very clear what this concept is. This concept, if you do not get it at this age, you will live a life of trouble for the rest of your life. If you do not get this concept now, you know, I do not believe the adage or the phrase that you cannot teach an old dog new tricks. That's not true. It's literally been scientifically proven that you can. Um, yeah. And several people have done great things in the latter part of their life. But this is kind of one of those things that if you don't get now, you're going to struggle with when you get older. Guaranteed. So let's, let's talk about these things. What are these things? So I want to turn your attention very quickly again uh, 
to the same scripture. And I want to go to verse 4. And and, and in verse 4, he tells us that we have promises that we might be partakers of the divine nature of God. There, we have the opportunity to partake in the divine nature. Okay, when you talk about divine nature, that's divine character. That's divine characteristics, divine thought pattern, divine mentality. Uh, How many of you would love to think like God? Man, his ways are higher than my ways. His thoughts are high above my thoughts. But I want to think like him. I want to act like him. I am calling myself a Christian. It would be really good to be like Christ. Amen. And so the divine nature uh, for a human being would be the divine nature of Christ. Christ had a divine nature. He was a man, but he was, his nature was a God nature. He was a man who ate, bled, died, slept, got hungry, got tempted. He was a man, a human being, but his nature was divine. That is the concept here that Peter's talking about is that this promise is, is that you can be like Christ. That the promise of God is this, is that you can be like him. Now, receiving the Holy Ghost is just the beginning of this process. And, and I want to just kind of freely and openly talk with you uh, today Because we have propped up the Holy Ghost as the ultimate final act of a Christian. When you get the Holy Ghost, you've arrived. But how many of you have the Holy Ghost, but you still struggle? (laughs) Of course. So just by common sense knowledge, we know that receiving the Holy Ghost doesn't fix everything. Receiving the Holy Ghost saves my soul, but I still got to live this life. Amen? And receiving the Holy Ghost does not magically make me better. Doesn't magically make me um, more uh, uh, able to uh, just become a, a great person. I don't receive the Holy Ghost on Sunday, and Monday night I'm preaching a conference. I know some of us would like to do that, but it don't work that way. And thank God for that. (laughs) So this is what, there's eight concepts here, eight concepts that Peter goes through in line and in order. Again, I read the Bible Literally, and apply that in a literal sense, okay? There's eight steps here that Peter goes through after this verse 4. In verse 4, he says that you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Verse 5, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith. So everybody say number one is faith. You cannot even begin a walk with God without faith. For if any man would please God, amen, he must first believe that he is. Amen. You, you have to believe. You know, somebody said, you know, all you got to do is believe to be saved. Well, that's true and also not com- a complete thought, okay? But you do have to believe. Amen. Do not ever frown on somebody who says, I believed, because they have taken the first step. You have to believe. When Paul was talking to the Philippian jailer, which is a very, very uh, good scripture that a lot of people who do not believe in the necessity of Holy Ghost will take you to the story of the Philippian jailer and say the Philippian jailer never spoke in tongues, so he was saved. Well, I don't have any evidence that he didn't. Just like you ain't got no evidence that he did. So I can't study the Philippian jailer because his story is vague. I must study Paul. Because Paul's story is not vague. 
It's very detailed. So in early Acts, he meets the Philippian jailer. He tells the Philippian jailer, believe. The Philippian jailer said, what must I do to be saved? He said, believe, believe. And be baptized and your whole household will be saved. So the Bible shows us those steps. The Philippian jailer believed. They went home. His whole household was baptized and they rejoiced. And, and that's the story that we have. Because the Philippian jailer did not believe he had to first start at belief, right? Go a few chapters later, Paul, because we're following Paul now, we're not studying the Philippian jailer. He's a vague story. We have to study Paul. Paul is the unvague story. So we're following Paul now. Paul goes to Ephesus. He meets 12 men that are learning of God. They, they are disciples. They've already been baptized into John's baptism. He asked them this, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Because they're at a stage that they're already believing. The next step for them now is to receive the Holy Ghost. I can't study the Philippian jailer. It's a vague story. The clear story is Paul. Paul says to them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we don't even know. I mean, what's the Holy Ghost? So Paul's like, okay, there must be a step missing here. How was you baptized? Because in Paul's concept of doctrinal salvation these men if they were baptized correctly would have already received the Holy Ghost so he says how was you baptized they said we're baptized under John's baptism he said get some water let's do this again times two that's why it's okay to get rebaptized. if you weren't baptized in Jesus name it's okay to get rebaptized. It's a statement of your faith. And so they, these men believed. He didn't ask them, do you believe? He knew they believed. He said, do you have the Holy Ghost? He said, yeah, we haven't heard of it. Well, they were baptized in Jesus' name, and then Paul laid hands on them, and they all received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right? That's faith. Somebody say faith. faith. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, if you've been baptized in Jesus' name, you've had faith, Congratulations, you're at step one. That's awesome, right? Step one is like legitness, and if you're there, that is amazing. But can I tell you that if you remain at step one, you will fall. If you just stay at step one, you will always fall. It'll be a vicious cycle of falling. You will continue to fall you will not live a life that is pleasing to God. You will not live a life of morality because the next step, he says, add to your faith virtue. Now, virtue is described as general morality, just basic goodness, basic morality. So we see this a lot in the church. From a leader's standpoint, I see this a lot when people first get the Holy Ghost. They first get the Holy Ghost they, before they have a Bible study, before they, you know, before I can sit down and tell them these things are wrong, whatever, you know, they'll, they'll come and say, Pastor, I quit smoking. I gave it up. Well, I didn't tell them they had to quit smoking. There wasn't a, we didn't have a non-smoking Bible study. <laughs> they say, Pastor, I went home, I poured all my booze down the toilet. Well, I didn't tell them that drinking was wrong. I didn't, I didn't have a, you know, a full-fledged Bible study about the dangers of liquor. But what happened is step one naturally brings on step two. You see, the, there's an effect here. Step one naturally brings on step two. Somebody say step two. General morality. Just a general goodness. Pastor, I've been, I've been working on it. I'm getting better. I'm not cussing as much. Well, we haven't talked about cussing. But in your basic genetic general makeup, you know it's wrong. In the code of your humanity, in the generality of the code of your humanity, you know some things are wrong. You don't need a Bible study. A two-year-old doesn't need a Bible study when his hand's in the cookie jar and mama walks in. Wasn't me. It's in his code. He knows 
stealing cookies is wrong. He don't need a lesson. He don't need a five-hour lesson on how to steal, how to not steal, how to wait for dinner. No, he knows this is wrong. It's general morality. And faith basically gradually brings you into a general morality. That is why when you see people that have no morality, they have no morals, they have, they have no direction and no litmus for any kind of, of, of good living as we would see it, just as a human being, you know those people are totally devoid of faith. They are devoid of the faith of God. Because if they believed in God, even a little bit, it would direct their paths. Because faith brings on general morality. But then the third, everybody say step three. I'm, I'm going to try to finish today. Step three, knowledge. Add to your virtue knowledge. This is basically, at its finest, catechism. Some of y'all is like, what? I mean, let me break it down for you in a word you can understand. This is basically indoctrination. This is basically Bible study. Read and learn. Let me just say this to you. That if you have faith and if you have a basic grasp on being a good person and you have no knowledge, you will fall. Why do you believe what you believe, sir? Why do you believe what you believe, ma'am? Can you give me one scripture on the oneness of God outside of Deuteronomy 6 and 4? Can you give me one scripture on the necessity of salvation outside of Acts 2.38? What your pastor quotes every Sunday. Do you have any knowledge of who you are, what you are? Men, do you know why you are to be holy in your mind, in your spirit, do you know why your modesty is unseen? That your modesty is in your heart, you don't wear it, you live it? Do you know why? Do you have the knowledge of why? Ladies, do you have a knowledge of why your modesty means so much? Do you know why? Do you have scripture? Can you go to the book and to the scripture and show me where the Bible talks about women being modest? If not, if you can't do that, you must be sitting here so upset right now that you got to dress like you're dressing. If you have no knowledge of that, if you're just doing it because the pastor said do it and the preacher said do it, if you have no knowledge of it, then you must be miserable. You must feel like an outsider. You must feel like an outlander. You must feel like so subjected to some kind of painful process of rules and regulations someone that says oh that's just legalism someone who says that to me has no knowledge you ain't read the scripture and if you did read them if you did read the scriptures you did not have an open spirit and basically you can't have knowledge until you got the holy ghost I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. Oh, no, no wait, wait a minute, Pastor Chavis. I know, I know you know, monks that, that, that can quote this Bible better than me. I mean, you, they have knowledge of the word, but they don't believe what we believe. Of course they don't believe what we believe. They have no spirit. Because the Bible didn't say theology will lead you into all truths. The Bible didn't say the pastor will lead you into all truths. The Bible didn't say that the Bible school will lead you into all truths. What did it say? What did it say? The, the spirit will lead you into all truths. So I have no argument with people that do not have the spirit but have knowledge why they don't see what we see. I got the Holy Ghost. I got the spirit. The spirit has led me into all truths. That's why you can't see what I see. That's why you can't read it like I read it. That's because you, you don't have a revelation you have a rule. You don't see it as revelation. You see it as reg regulation. But when that regulation becomes revelation, you'll say, oh, wow, I see it now. I, I get it. And not only do I get it, but I receive it. 
and I apply it to my life. Knowledge. Listen, church, young people, get understanding. With all you're getting, get understanding. Get knowledge. I mean, I said this here last year. I'll say it again. If you have never read the Bible from beginning to end and have a full grasp of what the Bible is speaking and saying, do not read other religious books. You should not read religious books from anybody, apostolic or non, if you have not first and foremost read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Not only read it, but have an understanding of it. You know why? Because every book written about the Bible is based off the Bible. And if you don't have a foundational knowledge of the word of God, you might read something in a book that messes your whole thinking up. But if you have an understanding, somebody said, well, you know, you got to, you know, eat the fish, spit, the, spit out the bones. Okay. What if nobody ever told you how to spit out the bones? What if you don't know what a fish tastes like? What if you don't know how a bone feels like? You got to have a basic knowledge first, right? Well, how can you have a basic knowledge of the word? Why are you reading religious books and you've never read the book that the book that you're reading is reading now has been written about? I read other people's books all the time. But I have a basic foundation of the word of God. So as I'm reading, I'm like, nope, that ain't right. <laughs> Good concept, but it doesn't fit into a biblical setting. You know, it's a, you know it, it, it makes sense as a human, but it doesn't make sense as a Christian because I have knowledge. Stop trying to prove people wrong that do not have the Holy Ghost. Stop debating on Facebook, please. The people you are debating do not have the spirit so they can't see the truth. Amen. Okay. So he says, add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge. That's three. And then he goes into number four. And to knowledge, temperance. Temperance is defined as self-control. Could not we all do a little better with number four. Here's the problem. Basic morality, virtue, and temperance are not together. There is something between morality and self-control. Because you may know to do good, but the power to do good is not in you yet. The power to do good is not the Holy Ghost. The power to do good is knowledge. What did David say? Oh, Lord, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin, 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 sin. It's self-control. Knowledge brings control to me. Young man, you can't give up pornography? Get in the word. Let the word help you. Read your Bible. Get in the word. I've been praying. I've been fasting. No, get in the word. Read that book. See what God is saying about that. Young lady, you have no control over your depressive actions and your depressive spirits and you keep acting out and doing bad and, and, and knowing you're doing wrong and you can't stop it. You have no self-control. Get knowledge. Open that book and see what God says about you, young lady. Your wealth and your value. You have no self-control because you have no knowledge. We are begging people. We are begging people to have self-control. We're begging people to, to have control of their life and they don't have any knowledge. This is a struggle as a, as a leader. As a leader, this is a struggle because I want people to do better, become better. Stop doing dumb stuff. And then, but I have to step back and say, wait a minute. Do they have knowledge? As a leader, I can't get up in my pulpit 
and tell people not to do things if they don't have knowledge of why they shouldn't do them. I find it very difficult to preach against things that I haven't taught about. Let me say that again. I find it very difficult to preach against something that I haven't teached about. Teaching precedes preaching. Well, God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Yes, he did. And, if, and if, if, there, if there could be another scripture, it'd say, and God chose teaching to keep them that believe. Because preaching is for saving. You're saved. What now? You need knowledge. Because if you don't have any knowledge, you're not going to ever have self-control, ever. You're never going to be able to control your lusts and your desires. You're never going to be a partaker of the divine nature. Because the only way to conquer and to have divine nature is to be free of the world through lust. And if you have lust in your heart, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, the pride of life, if you have those things in your life, you will never gain control over those things without knowledge. Learning, indoctrination, catechism. We have to have these things in our lives. Listen to me, young person. Stop depending on your pastor. Stop depending on your youth pastor to indoctrinate you. Get in your Bible and indoctrinate yourself. Read it. Get you an app and read it every day. Read it every day. This is a process here. This is a process. Number five is patience. And to knowledge, self-control, temperance. And to temperance, patience. Everybody say patience. Patience, patience is number five. Number five is the number of grace. Thank God for grace. Because it was in patience that God gave me grace. He, he had patience with me. And so it is in the fifth step of my walk with God that I learn how to be patient. However, patience is, in, is defined here not so much as how we define patience. When we see patience in the Bible, you know, the phrase, you're getting on my last nerve, comes to mind. You know, <laughs> I'm God working on my patience. But patience, patience in this setting, in this uh, uh, setting here is, is, is more than just, uh, you know, you're getting on my nerves, I need to be patient with you. It, is, it means loyalty. And commitment. You see, this is something that we lack in the church. In the church of God today, in my church, in your church, we lack loyalty. We lack commitment. We lack long-term people. Now, we can blame it on culture as long as we want to. We can keep doing that. Well, you know, it's the times. Everything's fast-moving. Everybody's busy and blah, 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 blah. I got game, blah, 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 hush, hush, hush. The problem is, is that you missed a step somewhere. And most of our misstep is knowledge. But I'm asking people to be faithful to the house of God. Faithful. I'm asking people to be patient to the house, loyal to the house of God. Patient, loyal to giving. Patient, loyal, and committed to the vision that do not have knowledge. They don't have self-control at home, in private. They have no self-control. So how can I, as a pastor, expect them to be loyal? They're not even loyal to them own selves. So every little fleeting thing in life runs them away. They're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine all it takes is a sniffle to stay home. This is, this is real life. All it takes is, we got in late last night, Pastor, so we're missing service today. What? You got in late? I was at the hospital at 3 a.m. and I'm teaching and preaching today. But you got in late. My bad, you know. We didn't get to bed till midnight. 
I don't even go to sleep till midnight. <laughs> it's funny, but as a pastor, this is what the stuff you hear. You're like, are you serious? Pastor's a long week. I'm just really tired. We're going to stay home today. We'll watch online. I want to block them. I don't know how I can do it, but I want to block them. <laughs> you can't watch online today. You don't get no Jesus today. You don't deserve Jesus today. It's a common theme in our culture, in our church culture. You know why? Because we have no knowledge. We have no self-control. So therefore, we have no loyalty. We have no patience. We have no continual commitment to the same thing. You show me people that are in their word, reading their word. They have knowledge. They have self-control. They're going to be there. Thick and thin, hell and high water, rain, sleet, snow. They're going to be there. They're showing up. I Listen, I, I get that life happens and you get sick and kids, I, I get all that. And every Sunday, I have that at my church. Every Sunday, every Sunday. But there's always those same three or four people. There's, just something, there's something going on, you know, it's always something. And it's like, you know what, at some point, you're going to run out of excuses. Or you're going to use the same one again and again until I'm, you know, and I'm, for me, it, it doesn't bother me as much as it bothers some people. I'm totally fine with it. I'm, I'm like, hey, you know, this is, this is your walk with God, not mine. I'm not your dad. I'm your pastor. I'm not, I'm not your daddy. I'm your, I'm your pastor. I'm, I'm not calling you on Sunday afternoon. Where was you at today? I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Now, if you miss three or four Sundays in a row, I may call you and say, are you dead or alive? Probably for you, young person, as, as a young person right now, probably for you, the, most, the worst thing that can happen to you is be in a church with a pastor like me because I'm not going to chase you down. I'm not going to chase you. If it's not in your heart, I'm just, I'm just running after nothing. I'm running after an uncatchable banner. So the worst thing for you, young person, is to wind up in a church with a pastor like me. That's not going to be your dad. It's just going to be your pastor. Be your pastor. Pray. Pray your pastor cares enough. I mean, it's not that I don't care. It's just I'm going to let you be grown. I'm going to let you be an adult. I'm going to let you make your own decisions. There's some people in my church that struggle with that. Pastor, you didn't call me today. So? <laughs> well, we were out. Well, I, I didn't know you. I didn't know you. Well, we were sick. I, I didn't know. Well, I posted on Facebook. I'm not checking your Facebook every five minutes, seeing what you're doing. You didn't tell me. No patience. No patience. This is going to bleed over into every part of your life, not just church. It's going to bleed over into your marriage. No commitment. No, no understanding of commitment. You get mad at her, you're going to leave. Guaranteed. I'm sitting with people in my office right now. Why y'all want to get a divorce? I'm fed up with her. Well, what she's done, it, she, she makes me mad. <laughs> my God, man. No, no, what did she do? Well, she just nags me. What did she do? Well, she, she's always on my case. What, what did she do? What did she do besides to be a woman? What, what else did she do? <laughs> it's the truth. Well, he hadn't talked to me. He hadn't talked to me in three days. He ain't said nothing to me. He ain't told me that he loved me. He, he didn't tell me I was beautiful. Well, what has he done besides be a man? <laughs> you think I'm going to sit here in my office and give you an okay to get divorced and you have no biblical grounds for it? You've lost your whole mind. <laughs> Grow up. I wish somebody would have talked to them when they were your age and told them patience is key for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life. Because patience is grace. Those two people have no grace for each other. 
They have grace for their kids. They have grace for their coworkers. They have grace for everybody, but they don't have grace for each other. He has no grace for her. No grace. She can't say anything. He has no grace for her. He can't say anything. They have no patience. They have no grace. It's going to bleed over into your job. You're going to go from job to job to job to job to job, and you're going to turn 45 years old, and you're going to realize I have no pension, no retirement, I have nothing. I have no career, I have nothing. You know why? Because you have no patience. You thought this was just a church thing, didn't you? To patience, godliness. <laughs> you know what godliness is interpreted as? Godliness is interpreted as what we consider holiness. Standards. Dress, actions, thoughts, character. Holiness, godliness. Here's our problem. We take people to step one and try to bring them all the way to step six. And the first little trouble that comes into their world, they run away. They have no knowledge. They have no patience. And we're wondering why we can't keep them. I'm wondering why I can't keep them. Our churches struggle because we've been taught in a, in a culture that told us that godliness was right next to faith, but it's not. There has to be knowledge. You, to be holy, ladies, can I get an amen right now? Because you bear the brunt of what we consider holiness. Doesn't it take patience? Doesn't it take self-control? When you want to look like the world and, and, and you have those pressures coming on you and they're real, they're real pressures. Doesn't it take knowledge to know this is what God wants? Doesn't it take a, a temperance and self-control to say, no, I'm not going this way. I'm not doing this. This is not what God wants for me. Doesn't it take loyalty and patience? So why would I tell a brand new young lady? Why would I tell a brand new young man, this is what we do. This is how we dress. This is how we act. And he has no knowledge. He has no patience. He has no temperance. I'm ruining him. Godliness is step six. Anybody know what the number six is? It's the number of man. Because step six is where you conquer the man. You conquer the man in step six. Step six is where the man takes a back seat and God comes forward. Young ladies, you're not just showing your holiness but you're showing your godliness it's when you step back and God steps forward young man you're not just showing your holiness you're showing your godliness it's when you as a human being take a step back and God steps forward and when I look at you I see God it's six not two not three not four, not five, it's six. Number seven. For us, number seven is almost going to feel like we're going backwards. But, but I want, I, this is my basic concept today, and I'm, I promise I'm not going to hold you much longer. Is, is this okay? Is this good for everybody? I, I hope I'm not too deep. I hope I'm not too... I don't, I, I don't want you to feel like this is a lecture today. I, I feel like I'm lecturing right now. But, but, but I want you to grasp this concept at your age, the age you're at right now because if you grasp the concept that I'm preaching at your age right now, the church 20, 30 years from now will be so much better than what it is right now. It's great right now. But if God tarries for 30 years, we're going to see some stuff that we're not ready for right now. We're not ready for that right now. Number seven, somebody say number seven is the number of completeness. 
Seven days in a week, got arrested on the seventh day. He was complete. He was done. He backed up. He said, ah, this is it, you know. Number seven is rest. On the seven is Sabbath. You rest on the seventh day. You, this is rest. And seven is brotherly kindness. The word used here is Philadelphia, which is brotherly love. Brotherly kindness. Now, for me and you, we're like, wait a minute. Oh, you, I mean, we went through faith and virtue and te self-control, temperance and knowledge and, and, and even, even holiness and godliness. Even holiness and God. And now we're at brotherly love. I mean, that, I feel like that's an early step, right, to love each other. But, but, but listen to me. We, we cannot be, you cannot truly love me without holiness. Because holiness is about brotherly love. Watch what Paul says. This is, this is a part of holiness. Paul puts it into a very, very feasible format thought process. Paul says, if I know that eating meat offends my brother, when I'm in front of my brother, I won't eat meat. That's holiness. Ladies, if I know showing my body in a certain way causes my brother to stumble, holiness. Men, if I know that my attitude and my ego offends my brother, I swallow my pride. Holiness. I would that men would lift up holy hands everywhere without wrath and doubting. That's ego. And I would that women would dress in modest apparel and live in modesty and sobriety. Ego, that's holiness. I would that men would be worshipers and that women would be modest. Holiness. If I know that going to a certain place would cause confusion for my brother, I'm not going there. Well, you can go. You're an adult. Go. I, I know I can go. All things are lawful. All things are not expedient. All things are lawful. All things are not a good idea. Why? You're not going to fall. I, I'm, I'm not going to fall, but it might make my brother fall. Holiness. This is brotherly kindness. This is not agape, which is number eight. This is not agape. I'm going to do seven and eight together because number eight, which is newness of life, newness, brand new, a new beginning. Number eight means new beginning. It's the first part of the, of the new week. It's the brand new day. When you, when you get to eight, we're starting over. This is brand new. You cannot be brand new in God. And you cannot have charity, which is interpreted agape, which is love for the world, if you do not have love for your brother. So what? So what? This is, this is, this is, when, in my full understanding of this study, and I didn't read this in a book, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not, I'm not saying this to be boastful. I didn't read this in the book. I didn't pick this out of someone's message somewhere. God gave this to me because I was on a personal journey to find out how to never fall. If, if you don't love your brother, I don't care how many people you fed. I don't care that your soup kitchen feeds a thousand people a week. I don't care. I don't care if you have a homeless shelter. I don't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, it means nothing. Your, your love, your charity is a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. It's nothing. We got people that will do anything for the world, won't do nothing for the man sitting on the same pew as them. You want to go dig wells in Africa and you can't speak to somebody in your own church? Can I tell you this? God is not pleased with you, sir. God is not happy with you, ma'am. You want to go on an AYC trip, but you won't talk to another girl in your youth group because you and her got beef? Can I tell you this? Your AYC trip is in vain. It is in vain. Because you cannot have charity without brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness literally means Philadelphia. And it really means from Jew to Jew is what it means. That the Jews love Jews or that we love each other. 
that in the church, brother and sister, we have to love each other first. You know how new people come into our church, love it, love the music, love the feel, and leave, never come back? They don't feel the love. You know how many people tell me at, at our church? And we started with, you know, 15 people uh, a little over three years ago. And, and this month we've averaged like 240, 250 every service. You know why people tell me that this is, this is my church, I love this church? Why? Why? Because I feel the love. And it's not something that we just magically made up overnight. We fight for that. A part of our membership process is a whole lesson on gossiping, talking about people. We call it practice holy conversation. That's what we call it. It's an entire day lesson on one another. Because I know that if people come into my church and they don't feel brotherly love, they will not feel his love. I'm not, listen, I'm not pulling this out of thin air. I'm not pulling this out of thin air. This is what Jesus said. For they will know that you are my disciples because of your suits and ties. They, they will know that you are my disciples because of your long hair. They will know that you are my disciples because of the length of your skirt. They will know that you are my disciples because you can speak in tongues. They will know that you are my disciples because you can lay hands on the sick and they're healed. Nope. They will know that you are my disciples for your love one to another. They will watch how you interact with each other. And when they see that you genuinely love each other, they will say, these are the people. These are the people we've been looking for. This is where we need to be. Honey, get the kids. This is the church we need to be in. Honey, crank up the car. We're going to church today. We're going down here to this church. They love each other down there. They care for each other down there. How can I give a man, a homeless man, a coat when I can't give my brother a conversation? This is how to never fall. This is how we never fall. He said, he said, this is what he said. He said, if you do these things, you'll, you'll, you'll never be unfruitful. You'll never be barren. <laughs> you, you, you show me a group of people, a youth group, a church that's barren, that, that has no fruitfulness, no life. And, and I'll, I'll show you a church where there is infighting. I'll show you a church where there is division. How can a kingdom divided against itself stand? It's destined to fall. We've missed this. Young people, let me speak to you as an adult in some ways. My generation has missed this. We, we struggle with this. We talk about each other over dinner tables. We tear each other down. Sometimes it's almost exciting for us to hear that a brother has failed. You, you, you have to do better than, than us. My generation is, we, we, we've killed each other. The devil didn't have to do nothing. I say the devil's been resting for a good while now building up his strength for the end time. And he's watched the church destroy the church. He's watched us stab each other in the back. He didn't even have to take his knife out. We've, we've hurt each other deeply. And so there's no trust. There's no camaraderie. And if you find it, it's rare. If you, if you find camaraderie, it's, it's really rare. It's, it's like, whoa. This pastor's friends with this pastor and they're in the same zip code? Whoa, that's crazy. That's crazy. You mean you and this guy play golf together and some saints from your church has left and went to his church, some saints from your church left and went to his church, you guys are still friends? 
Yeah, they're not my sheep anyway. It's, it's, it's rare. I expect haters out there. But it's hard when you got haters in here. Haters in here hold a, hold a whole different kind of weight. Say, well, Pastor Javis, hold on now. Judas betrayed Jesus. I know. But Judas was possessed by the devil. What's your excuse? Let that sink in for a couple seconds. Don't use Judas as your litmus test for betrayal. He was possessed by the devil. And the Bible says Satan entered him. So this is what I'll say to you. If you're betraying a brother, has Satan entered you? Why do you love them more than you love us? Why do you care for the outsiders more than you care for the insiders? When a surgeon does a surgery and brings a kidney from another human being, sticks it inside another human being, the body has a choice. The body decides if that kidney can stay or not. And if the body's not healthy, it will reject it every time. And I'll say that that's the reason why some of our churches don't grow. is because the body just rejects the new person because the body's unhealthy. We don't love each other. The, the body's in, in, in a fight. The body's in turmoil. The, the body is against itself. And so any kind of introductory of someone new just gets kicked out the door. And that's why we can pray through 200 people on a weekend block party. And six months later, not one of those 200 people are sitting in our pews. Not one. Does that bother you? Because it bothers me. It messes me up. And you can have any excuse you want to have for it. Any excuse. But I'll tell you, the body wasn't ready. We, we weren't ready. We weren't happy with ourselves. And we weren't honoring our own selves. So why would God allow us to honor other people? Sir, let me tell you right now. You, you may have a vision and a calling to another country, another state, Africa, you know, Zimbabwe, Tanzania. You may have a calling to some place where Jesus Christ has not even been preached yet. But can I tell you that you will go with a flawed, you will go with a flawed view of Christ if you do not fix it with your brother now. Let me tell you how important it was to Jesus. He said, if you come to the altar, if you come to the altar, and you have a gift, before you give that gift, I want there to be one thought in your mind, and that thought needs to be about your brother. Is, is, is it making sense to you right now? He said, he said, before you lay your gift on the altar, there, there, there needs to be one thought that runs through your mind. That's about your brother. And if you know that your brother has ought against you, leave your gift, Go to your brother, fix it, then come again and try it again. But don't you offer me a gift knowing that your brother is mad at you. Well, well God, he's mad at me. I'm not mad at him. He's, he, he's the one who's mad at me. He, he owes me an apology. And I'm not going to talk to him. He said that about me. I didn't say anything about him. I've been, I'm innocent in this. I am totally innocent in this. I'm about to rock your world, by the way. I'm totally innocent in this. I'm totally innocent. I'm, I'm blameless in this. I'm blameless in this. I'm, I'm blameless in this. He, 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 he said that about me. He was talking to her, and, and he said all that. I'm blameless in this. So was Jesus. Blameless. Sinless. But he took the fall and thought of me. 
when you come to the altar and offer your gift and you know your brother has ought against you, leave your gift. Go to your brother and be reconciled. You know what reconciliation is? It's when you take the blame for something you didn't do. You say, well, Pastor Javis, if I did that, if I went to him and told him I'm sorry and he's the one that hurt me, that killed me. It killed him. That'd be painful. It was painful for him. That just, that just buried me. It buried him. But he rose again. And not only did he rise again, but he rose with all power. I would say to you that there may be an anointing and a ministry waiting on you attached to an apology. Let me say that again. There may be an anointing and a ministry waiting on you, but it's attached to an apology. And when you can say, I'm sorry, God says, I can trust him with this anointing. I can trust him to reach the lost. I can't trust you to reach the lost if I can't trust you to love your brother. I need two strong guys right now, two, two strong young men to just step up here. D don't lie, you know you're strong, come on. Here we go, right here, right here, right here. So, y'all both, one come on this side, one come on that side. Yeah, just, that, that's, that's good, right there, right there, right where you are. From step one to step six, you're not involved with my walk. From step one to step six, my brother is not involved with my walk. It's, it's maybe leadership, pastor, teacher. But my brother is not involved with my walk with God. From step one to step six, it's all about me. I got to get from one and I got to conquer man. But when I leave step six and I step into brotherly kindness, now I'm attached. Come on. Now, just put your arm right on. I care about my brother. And my brother cares about me. Now I'm connected to the body. Now we become one in this step seven. Now Peter said, if you do these things, you'll never fall. He's getting it. He didn't say that you wouldn't stumble. He didn't say if you do these things, you never get weak. He didn't say, if you do these things, you'll never grow tired. He just said, if you do these things, you won't fall. I got a word for this generation. I got a word for this generation. It's time to bind together with your brother and your sister and say, hey, we may be weak and we may struggle. We may mess up and we may get tired, but I refuse to let you fall. You may stumble along your way, but I refuse to let you fall. You may grow weary in well-doing, but I refuse to let you fall. You won't fall on my watch. I'll go find you. I'll knock on your door. I'll get you out of bed. The pastor won't have to call you. I'm going to call you. Before the pastor ever picks up the phone to find out where you were, I'm already at your house saying, hey, man, are you good? Are we good? Can I pray with you about, you know why? Because I'm connected to you. You matter to me. You matter to me. If you matter to him, you matter to me. And let's together go help the world. Let's together go reach the lost. Let's together I pray that you get this in your spirit. I pray that you get this deep down in your heart. God cares about this. Remain standing. This is important to God. But more than that, it's important to you. This is how you're going to make it. You ain't going to make it on your own. Some of you have isolated yourself from your friends in your youth group. Can I tell you that is the first step to backsliding? Do not isolate yourself. I can almost tell you with almost 99% assurity that what you're thinking is wrong. And if you would just communicate, you would find out that what was said or what was done, whatever got you messed up, isn't as bad as you think it is. 
Just communicate. Go to them and say, hey, I heard you call me this. And whatever I did to make you call me that, I'm so sorry. Recently, I had a pastor, a friend of mine, say some things about me. He said it on a, on a forum that other friends of mine were on. I was called immediately. So-and-so said this about me. This is recently. I'm a grown man. This is recently. Hey, do you know this guy? Yeah, I know him. He's a friend of mine. But he, bang, psh, he was on here saying this, saying that. I was upset. I, 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 was, I was angry. I wanted to make a phone call. I thought about it. But then I thought about this lesson. My lesson that God was teaching me. I said, okay, God. I've been teaching it now for over a year. I probably should live it out. <laughs> so I saw him at an event recently. I went to him. I said, man, I, I said, I need you to know that what you said about me is, is not true. But, you know, whatever I've done to make you think that or feel that way, man, I'm so sorry. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want there to be anything between us. <clears throat> You're my friend. He immediately broke down. No, 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 it wasn't, this, it wasn't that way. He brought me context to the conversation. He brought me proof to the conversation. This is how the conversation went. I said those things, but I said those things in this context. When he gave it context, it took away the offense. I said, man, I'm, I'm sorry I was upset. Um, forgive me. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I even said those things, even in that context. I, I should have brought clarity to my conversation. I'm sorry. You know that me and that man will be connected now for the rest of our existence because we had a conversation, a grown adult conversation. Just a conversation. I, I, I want to admonish some young men in this room. Th there's some people that you need to apologize to. And some young ladies in this room, there's some young ladies that you need to apologize to. You need to, you need to make it right. Well, well, Pastor, you know, she said that about me. I didn't say that about her. I know. And that stinks. It, it really does. I'm not saying it's easy. <laughs> I'm not saying that this is just... But if you want to get to the steps that God wants you to get to, this is spiritual maturity. The deeper I grow in him, I'm finding out that it's less and less about me and him and it's more and more about me and you. Let me, let me just say that again because some of you are not really getting it. The more mature that I grow in Christ, I'm learning that he applies my love for him. He applies that through me and you. He watches how I interact with his kids. And when I see you as his kid, it changes how I see you. You want to prove to me you love me? Love my children. You, you want to show me how much you care about me? Care for my kids. There's a small group of people in this world that I trust my kids with. It's very small. But those people that I trust my kids with, I trust my life with because I know I trust them on every level because I trust them with my kids. Can God trust you with his kids? Because that person that you're so mad at right now that you're even thinking about not even doing what I'm preaching today, you're like, there's no way I'm doing that. 
Can I tell you that that person is God's kid? That he died for them? And he loves them? Well, pastor, they called me a fool. Even the more reason. Because he said if they called you a fool, they're in danger of hell, fire. Go save them. They're going to go to hell. They're going to go to hell because they're mad at you. Go save them. Go fix it. They're in danger of hell fire. If you know your brother standing on the precipice of hell fire, would you not reach out to him? Reach for him and say, man, come, come. I don't want you to go to hell. Let's get this right between me and you. Let's fix this. I I'm sorry. And I know we're not running the house today and shouting. And, 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 and this may not be the, the greatest lesson you've ever heard in your life, but I promise you it's one of the most important. If you'll get this, your churches will be better. Your families will be better. 13-year-old, 14-year-old young man right now, if you can understand this concept, your marriage is going to be better. Learn how to forgive. Learn how to move on. Learn how to repent. Learn how to love God's child. Your marriage is going to be better. Your college years are going to be better. Maturity in Christ is more about me and you than me and him. For they will know that you're my disciples when they see how you love each other. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I need you to pray right now. I need you to pray for yourself. God, I feel you in this room right now. There is an intense presence of the Holy Ghost here. And I know that feeling that's in this building right now. It is that same feeling that was in the upper room when they were in one mind and one accord and unity was there. Ah, God, there is an intense move of the Holy Ghost as it, that accompanies unity, brotherly love, and brotherly kindness and connection. Come on, I, want, I need you to pray right now, young lady. God, help me. God, forgive me for not thinking about my brother and my sister the way that I should. God, I thought being mature was just walking in holiness, but I see now that being mature is walking in unity, walking in togetherness, walking in humility with my brother, God. God, being subject one to another. Come on, somebody cry out to him right now. Come on, there's about to be a shift in somebody's spirit right now. Hey! Hey! Come on, there's a spirit of unforgiveness that's about to be broken in here. There's a spirit of unforgiveness. If you're in this room today and you have a spirit of unforgiveness, God is talking to you. He said, I forgave you. You messed up on me so many times. And I forgave you. You walked away from me so many times. And I forgave you. You hurt me so many times. And I forgave you. You talked about me. And I forgave you. Will you forgive your brother? Will you forgive now? Will you forgive? I still love you. I still, I still care for you. I still hold you up. That's what I'm asking you to do. That's what I'm asking you to do. Be like me. Take on my divine nature. Take on my divine nature. The divine nature of God forgives when there's no room to forgive. The divine nature of God cleans when there's no reason to clean. The divine nature of God. Come on, take on that divine nature today. God, show me that divine. You promised me that I could be a partaker of the divine nature. Help me forgive. Come on, I feel the Holy Ghost. There's a shift in this room right now. Come on, some young ladies ought to move out the aisle and find another young lady and hug her and say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Come on, there's somebody in this room that's offended you. Won't you find them right now? Why not? Why not? Why wait? Why not in this moment see what the Holy Ghost would do if you would go hug a brother?
and make it right. See what the Holy Ghost would do if you'd find a sister and make it right. I promise you there'll be healing. Healing of heart, healing of mind, healing of spirit. Come on, there's no room to be embarrassed right now. This is a, this is a safe place right now. Ain't nobody going to judge you. Ain't nobody judging you now. The Holy Ghost is here. He's asking you. You hear him. And he just had me confirm it for you. Move now. Move now. Find somebody. Tell them you love them, even if you haven't offended them. Even if they haven't offended you. Just say, hey, I want you to know that I love you. I care for you. Find a brother and pray with them. Find a sister and pray with her. Come on, there's going to be healing in this room today. There's going to be healing in this room today. Some of you are going to find out what it is to walk in spiritual maturity. You're going to find out what it is to walk in spiritual maturity. Sir, if you'll get this now. Sir, if you'll get this now for the rest of your life. If you'll get this now, young man, if you'll get this now for the rest of your life, you'll know what it is to walk into godly maturity. Young lady, if you'll get this now, if you'll get this today, if you'll figure this out today, you'll walk in spiritual maturity for the rest of your life. I love you. I'm sorry that I said something about you. I'm sorry that I held aught in my heart for you. I love you. I love you. Come on, somebody, make it right today. Make it right today. He didn't say you wouldn't get weak. He didn't say you wouldn't stumble. He just said you wouldn't fall. You're not going to fall because I'm not going to let you fall. You're not going to fall because I'm not going to let you fall. There's a healing in this room. I feel it. I feel it. There is a healing in this room. Come on, this is more. This is more. Husbands, you ought to take your wife by the hand. Tell her, I forgive you. Wife, you ought to take your husband by the hand. Tell him, I forgive you. Leaders, find, find other leaders in your youth group. Tell them, hey, let's bind together. Let's be connected. Let's make a force together, sir. Let's make a force together that we're not going to be divided on any issue. We're not going to see eye to eye. We're not always going to agree, but we're always going to be brothers. We're always going to hold hands. Come on, leaders, find a leader. Grab them and say, hey, we got to make a united front here. We got to make a united front here. We got to be in unity. This church ain't going to grow unless we stay in unity. Our youth group's not going to grow unless we stand in unity. We have to walk and stand in unity. Well, the devil don't want this. The devil don't want this. He's had us so mad at each other, so confused with each other, so at odds for so long. He's taking a break. He's going to have to go back to work again. He's going to have to start fighting again because we're going to be unified. We're going to be connected. It's going to be harder to make someone fall because brothers are holding them up. Yes, that's it. I see youth groups getting together. I see youth groups binding together. That's good. Let's bind together. Let's hold hands. Let's be connected. Let's unify. Let's see the same things. Let's have the same vision. Come on, if me and you can walk together, how can two walk together unless they walk in humility and humbleness? Not only do I love you, but I submit to you. 
I submit to you. I submit to my brother. I submit to you. This is holiness. This is godliness. This is completeness. Yes, 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 yes.
yes, yes. Come on, take on the divine nature of Christ today. Take on his divine nature to forgive those that aren't even worthy of forgiving, to look past pain that's too great to bear. Take on his nature today. Take on the divine nature of Christ. Forgive those that don't deserve it. Forgive those you don't want to forgive. They mistreated you. They've done you wrong. But you said, Father, forgive them for you. they know not what they do. That's divine nature.